So imagine you have a molecule of oxygen. It has to first get into your mouth, or I guess it could also go through your nose. And it's going to join up uh, either way and go down into your trachea, right? And from there, it can split off to your left lung or your right lung, let's say, uh, that we're facing this person. On the left, you've got one big lung over here with a little cardiac notch for the heart. And on the right side, you've got the the second lung, of course, and this one does not have any spot for the heart because it sits on the other side. And what I wanted to do is actually kind of zoom in and focus on this little alveolus right here because we know we have millions of these alveoli in the lungs and that's where all the gas exchange is happening. But exactly what happens needs to be clarified. We need to kind of zoom in and get some details. So let's focus in on what happens here between the alveolus, which is the last part of that bronchial tree, and the blood vessel. I'm actually gonna speed this up for you. So there you have all the layers between the alveolus and the capillary. Pretty impressive, huh? Now we have this molecule of oxygen drawing a circle around it. It's going to make its way from this alveolus out of the gas, and first it's going to have to go into the liquid phase. That's kind of a big deal, right? It's going to enter this thin layer of fluid, which coats the inside of the alveolus. Then the molecule of oxygen is going to go through the epithelial cells, those are the cells that kind of make the walls of the alveolus look the way it does. These are kind of the flat pancake-shaped cells. And it's going to go into the basement membrane. This basement membrane, remember, is kind of a foundation, uh, offers a lot of structural support to the lungs. And below the basement membrane, it has this layer of connective tissue that this molecule of oxygen has to get through. Enters another layer of basement membrane, and then it goes down into the endothelial cells. These are the cells that also kind of pancake shaped, and these are gonna make the walls of the capillary. From there, the oxygen molecule goes into the plasma, and then finally gets into the red blood cell. And of course, the red blood cells are packed full of hemoglobin, right? So this is a little hemoglobin protein here. And this hemoglobin has four spots on it. It's gonna allow four molecules of oxygen to bind it. And so once our oxygen gets there, it's gonna to hope to find some hemoglobin that it's got a little free spot and once it binds to the hemoglobin the red blood cell is going to now carry that oxygen out to the rest of the body wherever it's needed so that's kind of how oxygen gets from the alveolus out to the body now let me make a little bit of space i'm going to show you what i want to do i want to do kind of an interesting thing here hopefully it'll help you understand this journey that the oxygen molecule is taking a little bit better so let's imagine something like this where you've got a nice little rectangle. I'm going to try to draw this rectangle out on the side for you in kind of the same way I'm drawing it here. So just keep your eye on the colors because I'm not going to re-label any, anything just to kind of keep it nice and easy. What I'm going to do is just imagine that the oxygen is starting at the top of this rectangular uh, three-dimensional square-like uh, object I'm drawing. I guess a three-dimensional cube, rectangular cube. And then it's got to get to the bottom of this rectangular cube. So at the bottom, we've got the red blood cell and the hemoglobin, right? That's the last layer down here. And the top layer was the alveolus or the gas. So they actually sketch that in as well. And so that would be the very top layer. And it has to get through all these layers, right? This blue layer, for example, this is that, that uh, liquid that's lining the inside of the alveolus. And let me draw a molecule of oxygen starting its journey up here. That's the gas phase, right? So it has to actually get from that gas stage through the liquid layer into the next layer, which is the epithelial cell. That's this guy right here. That's the second layer. Third layer, we said, was the basement membrane. I'm just kind of going through them one by one. And this is also kind of a, a nice way of a review, I suppose, as well. Then you have all that connective tissue, nice thick layer of connective tissue. That's the green and remember the base membrane and the connective tissue, they're both chock full of proteins, different types of proteins, 
but both uh, there for structural support. Got some more basement membrane here on this side, and this is going to be right uh, before you get to the endothelial cells, right? That was the endothelial layer. This is the cell that kind of offers the capillary walls. And then we've got some plasma, we said. The oxygen has to get through some plasma. And finally, it's going to get into the red blood cell. So this whole bit, the reason I'm even drawing it like this or taking all the time to draw it like this, is that this entire layer right here, this is all liquid, right? This is all liquid and predominantly water. So remember, our bodies are heavily water-based. So our molecule literally is going from gas, which is at the top of our rectangular cube, all the way down through many, many different layers of liquid. So it kind of makes it easy if you kind of divide into these two categories, gas and liquid. In fact, this is now hopefully going to help connect with these equations that we've been learning. So now let me throw up a couple of equations that we've talked about before, and let's see if we can figure out how they relate to what we're kind of going through now and whether there's any clear relationship as to how to use these pictures that we've drawn up. So this first equation, this is the alveolar gas equation, right? We've talked about this before. Uh, there's a video on this as well if you want to refresh yourself. The first part of this alveolar gas equation tells us how much oxygen is going into the alveolus. Remember this top layer right here, this is our alveolus right here. So it says how much oxygen is going into that alveolus. And this is actually, this second bit is how much is going out. And if you, of course, subtract what's going in from what's going out, you're left with what is the partial pressure of oxygen in that gas space? What is this blue PO2 equal? And this is actually kind of a nice segue for our second equation, right? We have this second equation, which helps us figure out how much is going to, how much oxygen is going to diffuse, or any molecule really, according to this formula. This is Fick's law. And we can actually figure it out by taking a few parameters. We can say, well, if you know that the gradient, P1 minus P2, is a certain amount. And if you know the area and the diffusion coefficient and the thickness, then you can figure out V. And this V is really the amount, the amount of oxygen in this case. And we're going to focus on oxygen right now. Amount of oxygen diffusing over time. So this is actually uh, very helpful because if you start noticing that the amount of oxygen diffusing over time or the oxygen delivery uh, that's coming into the red blood cells is low, then you might start wondering why that could be. And remember the red blood cell layer that's down here. This is our red blood cell layer. So you start wondering, how is oxygen getting from that alveolus down to the red blood cells? And we can call the partial pressure of oxygen the alveolus. We can call that P1. And we can call the partial pressure of oxygen down here into the red blood cells. We call that P2. And so then when we figure out from the alveolar gas equation what this is, that is basically telling us this, right? So the two equations are basically very related. So if I notice that the amount of oxygen diffusing from the alveolus to the red blood cell layer is off, if it's less or more than what I expect, I have to go through a mental checklist. I have to think, well, you know, is the FiO2 what I thought it was? Usually room air is 21%, but maybe this person is on 40% or 50% because they're getting a face mask and they're getting a lot more oxygen than what is in the environment. So that could be one reason for getting a higher value. You might also get a, a higher or lower value because maybe you're not at sea level. Maybe we're uh, working with a patient at a mountain level or maybe below sea level. So that could also explain an abnormal amount of oxygen diffusing over time. And these two things that I've drawn in an orange box, they're both going to affect P1, right? This is the initial partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus. Some of these things are probably less likely to be changing, right? I wouldn't expect that the respiratory quotient is changing. You know, if the person has kind of a steady diet, then that shouldn't be any different. The partial pressure of water probably also isn't changing, especially if we're at body temperature. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, there that could actually change, but just to keep things simple, and if I'm only thinking about oxygenation, I'm just going to assume that that's going to be probably not the reason either. So going through my mental checklist, I know P1 is going to be something I want to think very carefully about. I also want to think really carefully about area. You know, what if it's because, what if the, the person I'm uh, dealing with has had uh, many alveoli that are no longer working. Let's say only half of their alveoli are working. That means that half of their surface area is gone, right? So they're really not getting as effective gas exchange because half their surface area is gone. 
and effectively only half of their alveoli are able to get oxygen to diffuse across. So surface area is very, very important to think about. And as is thickness. And when I say thickness, remember, the oxygen has to get all the way from this gas layer down into the red blood cell layer, right? So that's a very big way to go. And if you add a bunch of liquid to this layer right here, maybe to the connective tissue, if there's more fluid in those particular layers, those are usually the ones affected, then that's going to increase the thickness. So there's one more reason for why my amount of oxygen diffusing over time may be off from what I had expected. And again, down here, I wouldn't expect my diffusion coefficient. I wouldn't expect this to be different than uh, what I had expected because the diffusion coefficient is pretty stable, right? If we know that we're talking about oxygen within water at a certain body temperature, that's not going to change a lot. And finally, this P2, this is the partial pressure of oxygen that was returning from the body. So if the body is using up a bunch of oxygen and returning it, what is the oxygen level in that blood that's coming back? And I wouldn't expect that to change much because the body is probably using a fairly consistent amount of oxygen. So I'm not going to assume that that's the reason. So again, if you ever kind of come across an abnormal amount of oxygen diffusing over time from the alveolus down into the, the blood, you got to go through this kind of checklist and think about these formulas and how they help us be very systematically going through each of uh, these variables and thinking, what could be the reason that the amount of oxygen diffusing over time is more or less than what we expect?